Welcome to episode 140 of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNUs. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. And if you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. Coming up on this week's episode, we've got some updates from Red Hat's CentOS and RHEL topic that is still making waves. We've also got a lot of distro releases this week from Magia, Kali Linux, and one of the smallest distros around, Tiny Core Linux. Gnome has announced the beta release for Gnome 40, so there's a lot to talk about there. And then we'll check out the new exciting modular laptop that has been announced. There's a lot of cool stuff in this one, so we'll, we'll check that out. And later in the show, we're also going to check out the latest release of Mozilla's Firefox and a really cool piece of hardware from the RetroArch team. All that and so much more coming up this week on This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNUs. Just real quick before we get into the show, I want to give you a little bit of a quick teaser announcement that we're going to be giving a really big announcement on DL's next episode on 215. That episode will be streamed live tomorrow. So, well, if you, depending on when you watch this, it might even be today, because if you're watching the produced version, then there you go. If you're watching live with me right now on Saturday, then uh, tomorrow, in that case, we're going to be doing a big announcement that is related to the entire DLN community. So you don't want to miss that. It's, uh, it's very exciting to me. So I, I really want to tell you right now, but we're saving it for DL215. So be sure to be there on the live stream tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC, Sunday the 28th. I couldn't remember what day it was for a second. Now I do. There you go. Up first in the show this week is an update to the Red Hat CentOS topic. A couple of months ago, Red Hat announced it was shifting focus from CentOS Linux, the rebuild of Red Hat Linux Enterprise, aka RHEL, to CentOS Stream. For those who don't know what the difference is, well, CentOS Stream is a continuous delivery mechanism style distro that is upstream to RHEL. However, it is also worth noting that this does not mean rolling release. Uh, this is still a vastly more stable thing than the rolling release style because while it is not a rebuild of RHEL, it is still a critical piece of RHEL and arguably arguably more important to Red Hat now with this new change. Uh, but anyway, now it's understandable that CentOS users were not happy about that. Uh, this threw a pretty significant wrench in their plans, but since then, Red Hat has been releasing a lot of great news related to getting RHEL for free, as in genuine RHEL, not a rebuild. Uh, earlier this year, Red Hat announced... Uh, the no-cost rail for small production workloads and for um, customer development teams. And this week's updates to the story is more of the same regarding free rail because they are announcing that open source organizations will be able to get rail for free for open source infrastructure. If a nonprofit organization, project, standard body, or foundation is engaged with open source, that's how they just describe it, you can get a free a rail subscription with this program. So what are the options at this point? Basically what right now it works like this. Uh, Fedora is for driving the leading edge development and just kind of like a workstation sort of approach. A uh, CentOS streams to test applications and workloads against the next release of rail. Then you have rail with the free options for the open source infrastructure for uh, open source communities, projects, foundations, and that sort of stuff. And then you have the small production workloads, which is up to 16 licenses for free. And that's available for genuine rail as well. Also, you can, you know, pay for rail, of course. And also you can get one of the uh, rebuild alternatives and We'll get to those in a bit, but right now I want to give you a quote from the Red Hat Open Source Program Office Manager, uh, Jason Brooks, and he says, Supporting the open source software ecosystem is a core objective for Red Hat. This isn't a need that re revolves solely around making RHEL and other Red Hat solutions supportable in this landscape. We know that we are part of a larger interdependent ecosystem that we benefit from and which we do our best to foster and support. This support comes in many forms but often includes helping open source software projects, foundations, and standard bodies access enterprise technologies for development and testing. We frequently provide no-cost access to RHEL to these groups, but the process isn't as formalized, consistent, accessible, or transparent as we'd like it to be. With the announcement that we will be shifting our resources to CentOS Stream at the end of 2021, we want to make sure that those organizations engaged with open source have access to RHEL as they build and test the future of open source software. So as Brooks says, this isn't technically a new thing for them to do. They've been doing this for quite a while, but uh, they're making it much easier to, to participate in this program, which is fantastic. And with that said, this version of RHEL, though, won't work for all open source development groups at the moment. 
Uh, Brooks goes on to explain, we realize this program doesn't cover situations where open source projects are using public CIs or continuous integration infrastructure provided by third parties. This is uh, this and other programs are still being worked on. So we're definitely not yet done expanding rail programs to meet community needs and want to hear from you. And though I, they actually provided an email, I'll let you know that you can check the links in the show notes, but I'll also let you know that later on. Uh, but I wanted to get to cover one more thing. The executive director of GNOME and friend of the show, Neil McGovern, Govern uh, has a quote related to this news as well. And he says, as a nonprofit, we rely on donations to help us achieve our goal of a world where everyone is empowered by technology they can trust. Rail subscriptions are an essential part of this. With full operating system management and security updates, we can concentrate on the services we provide to GNOME users and developers without having to worry about the underlying systems. Red Hat has generously provided these services to GNOME at zero cost for years, and we look forward to continuing our relationship with it for a long time to come. So this is really good because uh, this is something that people were worried about in terms of the open source nature, but they were clarifying it's not, they're already doing this sort of stuff, but making it more accessible for organizations to be a participant in that is fantastic. Now, in contrast, there are some people who are somewhat negative to this news, of course, such as a Reddit user saying the only reason these changes happen is because of the backlash. However, it is important to note that Red Hat specifically said they would be making these kinds of programs in that CentOS uh, changing announcement. Uh, Mike McGrath from the Red from Red Hat also joined myself and the other hosts of Destination Linux for a candid interview about this announcement the same week it was made. And during that interview, Mike also reiterated that these things were on the way and were going through legal review, so to speak. So it's it's if you're not interested in the free rail, um, you can check out the uh, alternatives. But it is worth noting that. Rail Red Hat has been in plans to do these sorts of things, and they did announce that they were going to. They just didn't announce what exactly they were doing, and they still have certain stuff that they are working on to improve the uh, options for those who are affected by this change to CentOS. So, let's take a second and talk about the uh, alternatives to Rail, as in the uh, rebuilds of the for like basically Rail clones, and and most notably are Alma Linux and Rocky Linux. Alma Linux is already in development and shipping beta versions and production ready releases should be fairly soon uh, because they, they've, they've been really quick to release new versions. Uh, Rocky Linux, on the other hand, they haven't announced a roadmap really exactly for when the builds will be available. They've kind of given you an, a rough idea, but there's not as like Alma Linux is, is much closer to having a production ready out. Though it is interesting that Rocky Linux recently converted from a community project for to a for-profit business. And then I'm not saying that that's necessarily a problem, but I think it is important for people to know because if they don't want a financial incentive involved in their rebuild of rail, well, that changes some stuff for them. So there you go. So why would someone want free rail instead of using one of these rebuild alternatives? Uh, these no-cost rail subscriptions will naturally be self-supported by default, but it provides full access to Red Hat's customer portal, which means the knowledge bases, forums, and also includes what something is really cool, which is the Red Hat Insights program. So this is a proactive analytics tool, and it is essentially what it does is it scans your system for to for you to find bugs and vulnerabilities and that sort of stuff and provide an easy way to fix them, which is pretty awesome. Uh, this is one of the reasons I was super excited to try out the free rail uh, subscription model because I wanted to play with the Red Hat Insights because just I didn't even know it existed until this whole thing started happening and looking at the fact that I could finally get to be able to use real rail when previously that was not an option for me. Uh, but this is very, very cool. Anyway, something else that's worth noting is that Red Hat says that they may also be off, be able to offer no-cost support depending on the scope and nature of the organization in this open source infrastructure program. And this will be a game changer for a lot of organizations. It's already really cool that they make it possible for people to have uh, free rail for open source organizations, but being able to uh, potentially offer no-cost support, that will be a big difference. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about this new open source infrastructure from Red Hat, you can send an email to rosi-program at redhat.com or rossi I don't know, I'm not sure it's supposed to, probably not supposed to say any kind of acronym, but there you go. I'll have a. They'll have the the email in the links uh, and the and the links to this article in the show notes below if you want to check it out. I think it's really cool that Red Hat's doing it. I'm actually really excited about the overall uh, changes that are happening in this, and I'm actually making a video on this as well because I have a perspective that I think a lot of people are going to be very interested in, 
And also part of the reason they're interested is to disagree with me because I think if you, if you think about it, it's kind of a win-win for everyone. And be sure to subscribe to the channel if you want to find out why I'm saying that. So there you go. Up next in the show is the latest release of Magia. I think that's how you say it. It could be, I could be wrong. There's not actually an official pronunciation for it. And there's a lot of people who say it different ways. I'm going to go with Magia because technically that's the Greek pronunciation or so I have been told. I could also be uh, wrong about that, even just remembering what I was told. So Magia 8, uh, for those that are not familiar, Magia is a successor of the lineage of Mandriva and Mandrake. And Mandrake and Mandriva have kind of, you know, some people have nostalgia for those types of distributions, but uh, those are no longer around. So they check, they look at uh, Open Mandriva or Magia for that, that reason. Uh, and Magia in this case has continued development for their ARM support with both R ARC64 and ARM v7, now having all the packages built and being close to primary architectures now. Also, they have updates to their Wi Fi installation in the classical installer that uses WPA2 encryption. So that's an improvements to that. Also, they have added support for multiple different uh, part, uh, file systems for better partition management like NILFS, XFS, XFAT, and Windows 10 NTFS. They've also added some significant development improvements to the live installer, as well as boot times have been greatly reduced with the use of ZSTD or Z standard compression and improvements to hardware detection, which means faster boot times, therefore faster startup. Uh, they also have added support for encrypted LVM LUX, so that is great. Uh, and also they've done a lot of work on the removal of Python 2, which is very good to hear too. Uh, so also in this latest release, they've updated a lot of core p pieces like the Linux kernel has now been updated to the 5.10 LTS kernel. They've also updated the default desktop environment, which is KDE Plasma to KDE Plasma 5.20.4. And But they also have other options for different DEs. If you want to check those out, they have other options for GNOME and XFCE. And they've also done a lot of other updated packages to the vast majority majority of their packages in their system, which is really cool. And if you want to check out Magia, the successor, one of the successors to the Mandriva Mandrake lineage, then check out the links in the show notes for more, for more information and for downloads. Up next in the show is the very popular Kali Linux. Kali Linux 2021.1 has been released. This is a major release that comes with uh, only after three months of development from the previous release of the Kali Linux, which is really cool because there's a lot of good stuff in this. So Kali Linux 2021.1 comes with numerous improvements, new hacking tools, plus software and security updates. And just a quick note, I like the fact that this version, they use the date for the versioning because it, it's simplistic and I like that approach. Although it is oddly weird to say 2021. I just noticed during this this ep, this topic. Uh, anyway, just continuing. This is the first release of Kali Linux to be powered by the 5.10 LTS Linux kernel. And the biggest change in this release is the update to XFCE with now using uh, XFCE 4.16, which is the default desktop environment for Kali. There's also been a lot of new tools for the ethical hacking and penetration testing stuff, such as uh, Ergeddon for auditing wireless networks, Alt DNS for generating and resolving permutations, alterations, and mutations of subdomains. Also, they've added uh, Arjun HTTP Parameter Discovery Suite, as well as a couple of others that I want to talk about, like Chisel, which is a, DC, DC, a TCP UDP tunnel over HTTP. And also, there's Get All URLs, which is for fetching known URLs from Alien Vault's Open Thread Exchange, the Wayback Machine, and Common Crawl. And also, Git Links or Git Leaks a tool for searching a Git repo's history for secrets and keys, which you, if you find those, that's an issue. You should probably run on your own Git repository to make sure that you don't have those things accessible. And also one that I just like the name of it. It's for searching secrets in various file, file types, which is really cool. And it's called Dumpster Diver. Because reasons. I like it. Anyway, there's also a whole lot more of new tools on this latest release. Uh, but before we move on, I just want to take a moment to mention that while Kali Linux is very cool and very useful, uh, I, I feel like I need to address something about it that a lot of people want to use Kali Linux because it seems like a cool distro to use. And it is, it is a good distro and it is really cool, but it's not really made to be a daily driver. Uh, what I mean is that 
sure, it is able to be a daily driver for people who are penetration test penetration testing professionals. But if you're new to Linux, you should not be using Kali. Some people think that Kali must be ultra secure and all that because its purpose is kind of the but it but like I don't its purpose is the opposite of that. So I don't know why people have that. Uh, the interpretation, but it is a common thing I've seen where people who are new to Linux would ask questions about Kali and kind of the, the, the average response to that is don't use Kali because if you are very new to Linux, you should not be touching Kali. And that is true unless you're looking at it in the sense of, you know, in a virtual machine and you just want to learn. So it is, it's, it's cool that way, but Kali's purpose is to break into systems and networks, not to keep people out. So it's, Really, it isn't really a priority for them. For So for beginners shouldn't be using as a daily driver. Anyway, if you want more information about this latest release, Kali Linux uh, 21, 2021.1, be sure to check out the links in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform service is a solution to build modern cloud-native apps. Use a simple, intuitive, and visually rich experience to rapidly build, deploy, manage, and scale apps. It has support, support for multiple programming languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, and more. It also has support for static sites, Docker, and container images. And it has high scalability and zero infrastructure management. But what does that mean? Well, you simply point your GitHub or your GitLab repository and let the app platform do all the heavy lifting for you. It handles the infrastructure like app runtimes and dependencies so that you can push the code to production in just a few clicks. It also automatically secures apps by the doing uh, creating, managing, and renewing your SSL certificates as well as pr helping protect against DDoS attacks. And it also means that you can run code with little to no customization because the app platform uses cloud native standards and automatically analyzes your code, creates containers, and runs them on Kubernetes clusters. As a listener of the This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free, actually better than free, because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform. I want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Up next in the show, let's talk about laptops. Most laptops are not made to be serviced by the end user. These days, a lot of laptops excessively use glue to build the hardware. We're looking at you, Apple, and other companies, but definitely you, Apple. In some parts of the world, there are uh, warranty void stickers even in various places on the, on the hardware that if you break the sticker, they will refuse to cover the laptop under warranty. Now, part of me understands that there's some aspects of people messing with the machine and me messing it up and therefore avoiding warranty, but there are some places where they put these in an excessive way where it's kind of like abusing that method because you they're leaving it where you can't even add storage to your computer anymore with some, with some, some laptops. Uh, there are com like companies uh, encouraging users to update and modify the hardware, but they're very few. It's not a very, it's not a common trend to say the least. There's not, that's not to say that there aren't so, uh, you know, some of them that are making some really cool stuff, like there are companies that are offering modularity, uh, customization and repairability, but typically those are based on lower, low power ARM processors and cater to a fairly niche market. Uh, but that's where Framework comes in because Framework is in has introduced a new laptop, which is a new concept that is very interesting. So the Framework a company has preparing to launch a modular laptop that is easily upgradable and repairable with a powerful set of features. It will initially be offering a choice of the 11th gen Intel core processor up to 64 gigs of RAM, up to four terabytes of SSD storage, and a 13.5 inch display, which comes with a full HD webcam, a 55 watt hour battery, and it will not weigh that much. It's less than 1.3 kilograms. So these specs aren't too shabby, especially for something doing uh, an innovative modular style approach. Now here's where it gets really exciting though. Each laptop will also come with four bays compatible with the framework expansion card system that lets you select the ports via exchangeable USB-C modules, offering USB-C, USB-A, HDMI, DisplayPort, microSD, something they call ultra-fast storage, and a USB 2 gigabit Ethernet module is also in the works. Though this is... This is not all of it, though. You'll also be able to replace the usual stuff like storage, memory, and Wi-Fi module, but also you'll be able to replace the entire motherboard, the battery, the screen, and the keyboard. So this sounds all amazing, right? 
Well, this topic is not done yet. There's some even more cool stuff coming. So let's talk about documentation. That I don't think I've ever said those two sentences together of this is really cool and then documentation back to back where it actually makes any sense. But this case, it does. Each part will have a QR code that takes you to the relevant documentation on the company's page. So that is really awesome. Plus, the framework will also release specifications and reference designs for the expansion card system, which is fantastic because when I first read this, I saw the uh, custom expansion card module system that they built, and I looked at it and I go, okay, now there's still kind of be some lock-in here, but not, not with this because they are releasing it under a permissive license for the spec specifications and the reference designs, which will let the community design and sell their own expansion cards. Very, very cool. And another cool thing is that if you're lazy like me, you can purchase the laptop pre-built, but if you're not and you're more of a DIY person, then you can buy it as a kit where you get to put it together yourself, which is kind of cool and that I probably will not do. Maybe, but probably not. Anyway, it's not ready to order just yet. This will be more this is more of an announcement about it's coming soon. They say somewhere around summer 2021. Uh, but you can sign up right now to be notified when orders are available, and you can be sh uh, rest assured that I definitely did sign up to be notified. Hopefully, I'll get be able to get one in the first batches because I definitely want to try this out because this is a really cool concept. It, it actually, what's I've seen it before. I've seen modular laptops before, but never in a nice looking laptop and never in a slick uh, style. It's always these weird, clunky, super thick. Uh, devices and that sort of stuff. So this is super interesting. Not only is it cool in the modularity aspect, but also it looks nice. It also looks like a like a, just a normal laptop. And these card system, like these cartridges things or whatever they call them, like these are really interesting themselves because being able to make your own or having a company make their own to come, you know, sell different pieces and then you could theoretically change pretty much everything based on like they, you can change the motherboard, the keyboard, the screen and all that stuff. Very, very cool, and I can't wait to, you know, get one in my hands and play with it. I'm not much of a hardware person, but this makes me super interesting to interested to play with the hardware. So if you want to learn more about this particular hard, uh, piece of hardware, I'll have a link to the framework blog post related to this laptop in the show notes below. Up next in the show, GNOME has released the beta of GNOME 40. For those who aren't familiar, we've talked about this in a previous episode, and I made a video on my YouTube channel about the big changes coming to GNOME 40. And speaking of YouTube channels, did you know that this channel is also available on Odyssey and Library? Well, now you do. Links to those in the show notes. Uh, back to GNOME. So GNOME 40 beta includes the big redesign to the overview of the GNOME shell. Uh, GNOME 40 redesign changes a lot of the overview with the biggest changes in the workspace layout going from vertical navigation to horizontal navigation. That also applies to the app grid as well, uh, but the big change is mostly the workspace part. Uh, so the changes in orientation of the workspaces is uh, from, from vertical to horizontal, and that means that there's the na navigation workflow is going to be significantly different for uh, this next release. Uh, but it's actually kind of cool because they added touch touchpad gestures built in by default, so you can have uh, four-finger swipes to activate the overview or switch workspaces, which is a really cool cool thing. And I wish all DEs had touchpad gestures for that because uh, navigating on a touchpad is not ideal on a laptop. But if you could, you know, a mouse is not so bad. You can do certain things with it that makes it easier, like the scroll wheel and that sort of stuff. But you don't really have that on a touchpad. So the touchpad gestures is fantastic. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is a lot of people excited and also just as many worried about how big the change in the workflow will be. If you want some more information about the GNOME Shell changes specifically, though, go to check out the episode 131 where we talked about it on Twill and also the video I made about the GNOME 40 releases because I think there's a lot of cool stuff about it. And also, I have a different take on it that might be unique and you've not heard it before. So check that out. Links to both of those in the show notes below. But in addition to the changes to GNOME 40's shell, uh, there's also big updates to Mutter, including starting X Whalen on demand. And this is cool because uh, by having it built this way, I mean, X Whalen supports would be only started up when the application needs it for running X11 client stuff. And by doing it on demand, it just it activates only when it's necessary, which is very cool. It also adds support for uh, atomic mode setting, which uh, if you're not familiar, atomic mode setting is a cleaner style than the old legacy mode setting thing. But essentially what it does is that atomic mode setting allows for testing of modes of the display prior to uh, applying which can be 
be re- which can reduce the flickering of the system and also tends to be a faster method of mode setting. Uh, GTK 4.1 is in with its various fixes and improvements as well. And there's also some interesting stuff that's not necessarily GNOME shell related stuff. It's also like they have new language features and new APIs for the GJS JavaScript support and also some improvements to GNOME Calculator as well as something that is fairly, is is really cool because I'm pretty sure this is talking about um, this potential of being able to bring in API, uh, web extensions from other browsers. So because it has experimental support for uh, web extensions APIs for uh, other improvements to the GNOME web browser, which is Interesting because I'm curious to see how 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 that reflect uh, uh, how that reflects words sometimes how that reflects the support potential for porting of web extensions from other browsers. That'd be really cool because one of the things that it's I like uh, GNOME Web, aka Epiphany, for various different reasons, but it is missing a lot of ex- ex- extendability and some add-ons and stuff. And if it had those, would they be able to port? That'd be really, really interesting. So I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to see what that happens. Uh, if you want to check out the GNOME beta, there are a couple of ways you can do it. You can check out the Rawhide version for Fedora. You can also check out the uh, GNOME OS. But, you know, quick reminder, uh, GNOME OS is a development testing thing. It's not really meant to be a daily driver distro. So if you want to try it out, uh, keep that in mind. So you'll need to be running it in a virtual machine because it doesn't have the hardware booting capabilities. So if you know if you want to try out GNOME 40 that way, you'll need to do it in a virtual machine. So if you want to find out more, I have a links to the uh, mailing list as well as a a uh, blog post on the GNOME Shell 40 and the differences between the mutter and, and the multi-monitor support and that sort of stuff. I have links to all of that in the show notes below. Up next in the show, I want to talk about the Collabora company because they've been doing a lot of important work recently and in the background, so I wanted to give it highlight and kind of bring it to the foreground. And last week, we talked about Linux 5.11 introducing syscall user dispatch, which is a way to intercept system calls from Windows applications and games for better performance. And it turns out Collabora is the company behind that work. And also, they've been doing quite a bit more. So Collabora has been working on hardware accelerated decoding for the video for Linux 2 uh, project, or the V4L2, which is great for stateless hardware acceleration for stuff like FFmpeg and that kind of thing. And another thing that they have been doing is that they have been working on a Wayland driver for Wine. Now, this is the thing that I was really interested in talking about in this case because having, uh, you know, Wine is a very important piece of the ecosystem for people who need to run Windows applications. And by not having Wine as it is right now on Wayland, when we switch to Wayland as an ecosystem, that would be pretty problematic. So it's really important that they are someone is making that that software and the driver for it, and Collabora is happy to be doing that. So they're making this um, this Wayland driver for Wine, which enables you to run Windows applications and games via the Wine compatibility layer on Linux distros that use the Wayland d- uh, display protocol. And this all this latest release, they've added some uh, pretty interesting things. They uh, I'll, real quick a quote from the uh, blog post. They say that the focus of this update is to support a number of new features that are useful for applications and games, and which also have been considered a potential integration pain points for the Wayland driver. And those things are uh, bi-directional copy and paste support from uh, both Wine and Wayland apps, which is very important. Also, the ability to drag and drop items from native Wayland apps to Wine apps. And also a really big one is support for changing the display mode. Because the ability to change the display mode is important because Wayland currently doesn't allow apps or games to directly change the mode, which makes changing resolution inside of the game settings rather difficult. And this is addressing that, which is great. So I just wanted to say, you know, quick thanks to Collabora for their work on all the th- these things. And I think there's a lot of companies and organizations that do important work in our ecosystem and community, but they they typically don't let people know about what exactly they're doing. So it's not you know, in the forefront and people are not talking about those things. And I'm always glad to see when companies take a proactive approach in letting us know, because then I can share you, share with you uh, the cool stuff that they're doing. So for comf- for projects and companies that are doing a lot of cool stuff in the Linux ecosystem, but are not getting attention about it, maybe it's because people just don't know about it. And if that's the case, be sure to send me an email and I will add it to the show in that kind of case. So just a, just a thought. If you'd like to learn more about uh, what Collabora is doing and what they're working on, you'll find links in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. 
Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is a password manager and it's very important software and it allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. And how does it do that? Well, securing your online accounts is very important because the best security practice for passwords is to have a different password for every account on every website that you sign up to. I mean, there's so many stories that I'm sure uh, everybody who's listening has had at least someone come up to them and tell them that they use the same password for everything. And it's just a terrible password. And, you know, that that's that is not a good policy to do. And having a different password for different for every account on every website is basically a necessity at this point. But that's also kind of painful unless you have a tool that makes it easier, such as Bitwarden. Bitwarden solves this by providing tools that's to store all of your passwords in a secured vault, auto generating those passwords for you and even automatically filling in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to. And you can access your data across many types of devices like your web browser, using your mobile apps, desktop applications, or even on the command line. Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices, so you know you are the only person with access to your data. And Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust, not only because it has all these great features, but also because it is 100% open source software. Software. That's right, 100% open source, which means the features and security of their infrastructure can be vetted and improved by the community, but they don't just stop there. I mean, they could just stop there. That's awesome in itself. But they also bring in third-party security firms to audit their code to make sure it is as secure as possible. And you can get started, again, by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN and get started for free. But you can also check out their premium account because I think you will definitely want to do that, especially considering it only costs less than a dollar per month. That's right. Less than a dollar per month will get you one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and much more. You get all this for just $10 per year. That is less than $1 per month. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. That's that you get peace of mind for your passwords and other sensitive data while also supporting a, comp- a company that truly gets open source. Sign up for their $10 per year, less than a dollar a month premium account to let you let them know that you appreciate them supporting open source and also supporting This Week in Linux podcast. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is some really cool gaming news from the RetroArch team. Uh, RetroArch have announced the Open Hardware Project, which is a very cool DIY emulation project, which we'll get to in a second. But first, I want to talk about uh, RetroArch having created something called Low Res NX, which they refer to as a fantasy console. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of like an emulator of a retro console that never actually existed. Similar to the Pico 8 virtual machine emulator that emulates the harsh hardware limitations of the video game consoles during the 1980s, in this case, Low Res NX is an emulator for handheld fantasy console. Essentially, you can use this to create your own retro games that are playable via, via RetroArch. Uh, and I, I, don't know, I don't know how practical this kind of thing is, but it is very interesting to me. An emulator of a console that doesn't even exist, that's, that's awesome. Uh, But let's move on to the next part that I think is going to have a lot of people really excited, and that is the new DIY hardware project that they're working on. Uh, This RetroArch RetroArch team expressed that they have frustrations for the general state of retro gaming scene when it comes to being able to dump and play your own legally bought game cartridges. A lot of developers who, you know, you talk to about the games that they created for these old consoles would tell you to, you know, dump the, you know, tell the people to dump their own game cartridges. But the solutions for that are not ideal. So uh, the RetroArch team is creating the Open Hardware Project, and it's an attempt to shake up this sector of the retro games market. For those who don't know, it is possible to dump the data of a cartridge of an old console, uh, but it's not easy at all, and also a couple of barriers are the fact that it's very expensive. Uh, the, a lot of the hardware that allows you to do it is no longer in production, or the ones that are are always out of stock. It seems. Uh, also, the rights to the different products change hands seemingly often, so that makes it harder to find a place to buy the different uh, devices. So it's just kind of an issue. However, RetroArch and their open hardware project, they've made a proof of concept where they have this adapter essentially for N64 cartridges where you plug in a cartridge and this adapter connects to a computer with a USB-C cable and then maps the contents of the cartridge itself as a mass storage device volume. 
This means that the EEP ROM, the flash, the ROM, and the SRAM are all mapped as separate files on this mass storage volume. This makes dumping of the cartridge much easier and much more affordable because they're making it like this is a proof of concept, but their goal is to make it uh, available to uh, people in a reasonable price. And also not just N64, but other types of cartridges being able to do this sort of thing. But it gets even better, though, because RetroArch says that they are working on making it not just a data dump tool, but also that you can connect a cartridge to your PC and effectively play it right then through the RetroArch system. So this is very, very cool. Uh, I have a lot of retro games that I have uh, I would like to play, but I haven't done so because when I looked at the options in the past, they were just not worth it because they were very expensive and also trying to like, you know, find one in stock was quite difficult. So I just, you know, gave up on it. But this one allows me to actually have these things that I, I already own. Like I have a box of all my uh, consoles. That's just all of it, you know, all the games and the and the stuff is all in this one box. And it's a very heavy box, by the way, not relevant whatsoever to this topic, but it is very heavy. And you can see in the background, I have a, a Dreamcast here in my setup. It's my favorite console, but I'm actually going to be adding a couple more because there are some great other consoles, including the N64 to the backdrop. Uh, not necessarily related to this topic, but, you know, I think it's kind of cool to have like to show off those consoles because I think they're great. And I and I do I am really happy to see that RetroArch is making it easier to play these games, especially the ones that um, you know it, legally speaking, it's hard to you know have these games. Even if you bought them, it's technically like it's it's a gray area of how you get ROMs. But having something that makes it easy to get the ROMs directly from the cartridges you already own is awesome. So you know, hopefully, I can convince them to let me be a beta tester. That'd be great. And um, if you'd like to know more about this. You can find links to the blog post about it in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about my preferred browser, which is Mozilla's Firefox. And while I'm not a fan of everything that Fire Mozilla does, Firefox is a very important piece of the open source ecosystem. So I am a big fan of Firefox. So Firefox is also known for its privacy focus for users, and this release enhances that even more. So Firefox 86.0 introduces total cookie protection in strict mode where every website is then bound to its own cookie jar, as it were, to better prevent sites from tracking users site to site. And it also having this added with the network partitioning feature is a very good thing for the privacy defaults. And it improves those quite a bit because if you're not familiar, the networking partitioning uh, feature allows you to uh, block certain pieces of different cache, like for example, image cache. So by default, the system is in the background doing this automatically for you, but having this in conjunction with the total cookie protection is fantastic. It's even more privacy focused stuff, which is always great to see. And also um, Firefox 86 has added a bunch of new features. So we're going to talk about a few of them. They've added you know, improvements to print, uh, print functionality. They've also added imp improvements for and stability improvements and also performance improvements for uh, canvas drawing and WebGL drawing to the GPU process. And also they have added support for simultaneously watching multiple videos in picture in picture mode. Now, when I originally saw this, I thought, why would you want multiple pictures like this? Or mo wait, multiple pictures. Why would you want multiple videos and side by side like that? That doesn't seem very practical. And in a conversation on the live stream, it was pointed out to me by a patron that the uh, multiple videos thing is quite powerful in when you're not talking about necessarily videos, but for example, like WebRTC through Jitsi, because technically speaking, all the videos are, 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 are feeds that could be popped out with this picture in picture mode and having it simultaneous means that you can pop out the individual videos while also be, not, not just being lo limited to one person, which is a really cool f a facet. And there's also some other things that initially did not come to mind, but that's a really good example because you can have you can have stuff pop out with you know being able to have a conversation with people in uh, a pop out windows, but also being able to use your browser still, which is really cool. So there is that. Uh, if you are wanting to be able to do picture in picture with multiple videos, now you can, which is really cool. And if you'd like to check out more of the latest release of Firefox, you'll find a link to the uh, Firefox 86 release notes in the show notes below. 
Up next in the show, we're going to talk about a major update to one of the smallest, most modular Linux operating systems that has been available for a long time, and it is Tiny Core Linux. So this latest release is Tiny Core Linux 12.0. If you're not familiar, Tiny Core uses BusyBox Userland uh, utilities. It's uh, it also has support for other things like uh, you know glibc and binutils as well, but it's uh, it's BusyBox user uh, Userland re related. Uh, but Tiny Core Linux 12.0 introduces a number of new fixes, package updates, updated hardware support, and all sorts of stuff. It has support for 32-bit, 64-bit architectures, as well as Raspberry Pi systems, uh, specifically Raspberry Pi builds. Uh, and also, um, if you're a beginner to uh, Tiny Core, I would check out, there's multiple different additions for uh, Tiny Core. There's Core, there's Core Plus, and there's a bunch of others. And I would recommend checking out Core Plus because it has a bunch of window managers kind of uh, re ready to go, like OpenBox, Fluxbox, JWM, IceWM, and etc. So it makes it easier to get started with it. However, uh, it is to keep in mind that Tiny Core is, it's called that because it is very, 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 very small. And it doesn't have all the all air, all the bells and whistles of a distribution. It's kind of like trying to be as minimal as possible. Very very small. I think it's like fifty megabytes in the system loaded. Uh, it's really really interesting. And if you want to check out Tiny Core Linux, uh, you'll find links in the show notes below for the latest release of Tiny Core Linux twelve point zero. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And if you become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium. That's what we call the patron-only room. I don't know why, but we do. And there we go. You can join me to discuss things, but like in between topics, we have rangents, which is tangent and rants combined. Sometimes that happens on the stream, so be sure to do that. You can be a part of that as well as contribute to those rangents if you want to by becoming a patron. Uh, and also just hang out every week after the show. You can also order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt to support the channel and the show by going to dlnstore.com. This is the shirt that I'm wearing in the video version of the show. And that is a shirt that I designed to convey the message that whether or not uh, Linux is there, whether or not you know Linux is there, it probably is. And that's why it has Tux blended into the background of the shirt. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of both of those shows on the Destination Linux network. You can go to destinationlinux.network to check those out. And just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week by going to dlnlive.com. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for your weekly episode. Your weekly episode? No. For your weekly source of Linux good news.